Um, this is, the next talk is about privacy on the internet. And we all know that privacy, uh, certainly on the internet, and maybe as a whole society, is disappearing. We have tracking systems and these huge data leaks and entire fake websites and bots and so on and so forth. And the question is, what is to be done? And our next speaker is someone who has some ideas about that. This is Mark Rotenberg, President and Executive Director of EPIC, which is the Electronic Privacy Information Center, an independent public interest research group in Washington, DC. He teaches privacy law at Georgetown School of Law, litigates open government and privacy cases, studies emerging, emerging privacy and civil liberties issues, testifies before Congress and at judicial conferences. He is one of the experts on privacy. He's a graduate of Harvard and Stanford Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Rotenberg. How's everyone doing, okay? We hit the mid-afternoon point. Congratulations to you all. Thank you for staying. I'm not sure what I'm going to say, but maybe we'll all find out together. Um, I'm really honored and pleased to, to be here this afternoon. Like uh, for many people, uh, Ralph has been an idol, uh, an inspiration. I've read some of your books, Ralph, not all. I'm working on it. Um, but I was also inspired uh, by him to start an organization 25 years ago called uh, EPIC. And our mission was to focus on emerging uh, privacy and civil liberties issues. And let me assure you, it's been quite a ride. Uh, we've had a good time. We've gone after the CIA, the NSA, Google, Facebook. My current case is for the complete release of the Mueller report. You can get this online, by the way. So that's out there. Um, and we're working on things like artificial intelligence and human rights. Basically, where do we hide when the robots take over? So we're all about the 21st century. But what's so remarkable, and I think so important, about this conference today is that we are also firmly grounded in one of the most important tenets of American law, which is the right to seek redress for harms that are suffered, the tort right. And it is interesting for my organization in particular, because although we sound like we're all about the 21st century, we actually begin at the end of the 19th century with a very famous article by a person who did deserve to be belong on the US Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, called the right to privacy. And you see the remarkable thing about this article that Brandeis wrote in 1890 was that he was trying to understand how do we protect against non-physical harms. You've heard today about very consequential physical harms, all sorts of ways that people can be injured by machines, by doctors who don't know what they're doing. But there are also ways in which people can be injured by information, by data, by personal facts. And this is the issue that Brandeis addressed in his article, and he said, how do we create a legal right? It's not simply a, a breach of a, of a contract or an agreement. A lot of times people have information about us that we have no relationship with. The data broker industry, for example, in the United States, which may well determine whether you get in a job, you get an apartment, you go to a particular school, we don't interact with as their customers, but they build deep profiles about us and use that information, accurate or not, to make determinations that impact 
our rights and opportunities. So you see, privacy is not covered by breach of contract. Well, Brandeis said intellectual property. Now that's an interesting idea. We have this notion of copyright, let's say, which does protect intangibles. But the purpose of copyright, of course, is to promote dissemination of information. And when we think about privacy, we think about trying to limit the disclosure of information. So that didn't quite work either. Brandeis said, well, what about defamation? We can think about a privacy harm as when someone says something about us that's slanderous, let's say. But what's interesting about the right of privacy is that oftentimes it could involve true facts. It could involve, for example, a medical diagnosis that you are dealing with, that your family is dealing with, but frankly is no business of your neighbors or your employer, right? So we have a concept that even with certain types of information that may be true, it can still cause harm if it goes to others. This is the right of privacy that Brandeis described in the latter part of the 19th century. But let me tell you something else about this article. This guy was a really good student. He didn't just go for A, he looked toward the end of the question for the extra credit, right? The other thing that Brandeis does in this famous article is he said, well, of course, we have to consider competing interests. And one of the most important competing interests we confront in the privacy world is the right to know the right to know information about others, which for a person who's running for public office, for example, might be quite important. If a person says publicly, I'm against homosexuality, I think marriage only exists between a man and a woman, but in his private life perhaps acts very differently, Maybe that's something we have the right to know about a person who stands for public office. But for a private person, where such determinations, where such prying seems somehow less relevant, maybe we don't have a right to know. And you see, Brandeis also wrestled with that question in his famous article on the right to privacy, talking about the public's interest in how we evaluate those who choose to run for public office to a different standard as opposed to people who choose to be simply private. And I'm going to put in a footnote here, by the way, wonder, one of the wonderful things about privacy law today is it's such an issue around the world, we get to talk about developments around the world. There is, in Europe, a legal standard now for the so-called right to be forgotten which has been described in the US as very controversial and as opposed to our First Amendment because somehow people should not have the right to be able to withdraw private facts that really aren't relevant to the public. So they say, oh, that right to be forgotten, that's very much a European privacy thing, ignoring that in the US, for example, we have expungement for financial records and criminal records. Putting all that aside, I'm a big fan of the European right to be forgotten because I see in that decision, in that doctrine, almost exactly what Brandeis was talking about in his famous article in the 19th century. It is a powerful claim. It is not an unbounded claim. It is also the cornerstone of our modern right to privacy. Now I'm gonna read just briefly a section from my, um, I have a case book on, on privacy law. I don't recommend you buy it, by the way, it's super expensive. <laughs> and, and if you do buy it, I only get a little bit. So contact me, I'll get you an author's copy or something. But, but here's, here's a, um, uh, excerpt from one of, my, one of my favorite cases that tells us also something critical about this privacy tort. The plaintiff, an author and lecturer on automotive safety, 
has for some years been an articulate and severe critic of General Motors products from the standpoint of safety and design. According to the complaint, General Motors, having learned of the imminent publication of Mr. Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed, decided to conduct a campaign of intimidation against him in order to, quote, suppress plaintiff's criticism of and present, prevent his disclosure of information about its products. To that end, General Motors authorized and directed the other defendants to engage in a series of activities which Mr. Nader claims violated his right to privacy. This is an opinion from a New York court in 1970 on General Motors' motion to dismiss, which they lost. The case went forward, good lawyering there. On the right to privacy, not only as to the intrusion into Ralph's private life and the harassment that he suffered, but also as a consequence of his willingness to be outspoken and to take on large corporations in the United States. You see, here the right to privacy was not simply protecting the right of an individual. It was safeguarding a political right, a democratic right, the right to speak openly and to gather support for your causes. And I teach this case along with another case I'm a big fan of, NAACP versus Alabama. You all should go to law school, by the way. See some people nodding, couple people, yes. You should, especially if you're here today. NAACP versus Alabama was a case involving the state of Alabama that was trying to obtain from the NAACP chapter the local membership list because the NAACP was, in fact, a foreign corporation headquartered in New York with an office in Mobile. State of Alabama said, and this is not unusual, by the way, we need the names of your officers and contact information for your local chapter. A lot of corporations actually confront that responsibility. But Alabama made it a little bit more interesting they said, oh, and by the way, we'd also like the names of all your members here in the state of Alabama in the year 1955, okay? And the NAACP resisted. The case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in the Supreme Court decision striking down that state requirement reached a remarkable conclusion that the privacy interests of the membership of that organization, very unpopular in the state at that time, was protected by our First Amendment, our freedom to associate, our freedom to express our political views. And I share this point with you also because oftentimes when we talk about the right to privacy, it is held out against the First Amendment. And people say, well, yes, privacy is important, we understand that. But so too is the First Amendment. When someone says that to you, just remember, I wrote, that guy was telling us about this NAACP case. And protecting privacy also helps safeguard First Amendment freedoms. I, I teach those cases together because I think of Ralph's work and I think of the NAACP and, and civil rights and I think about the role that privacy protection plays, frankly, in promoting civil justice. Now, let me say a few more words about the evolution of the privacy tort, and then also where I think we are today. As much of a fan as I am of Louis Brandeis, great on privacy, great on uh, federal rights, great on the First Amendment, labor rights. I'm, I'm leaving out lots and lots of things. Ralph will, will correct me later. I also remember about 25 years ago when I started teaching, uh, someone who I admired very much, and I ended up writing my, my case book with, Professor Anita Allen. Uh, she's a, a vice provost now at, at uh, Penn. She said, well, 
Mark, I like you, but, but let's be honest. I mean, Brandeis, kind of a patrician, Beacon Hill sort of white guy dude. I mean, do you think he really understood what privacy really means, for example, for a woman in a home, in, in, a, in a bad relationship? The law doesn't always work so well, and traditionally did not work so well for people in those circumstances. And over time, I would say one of the remarkable developments in the privacy tort has been a greater recognition of some of the specific harms that are directed toward women in our digital age. And I think, for example, of the work of a wonderful privacy lawyer in, in Brooklyn, Carrie Goldberg, uh, Daniel uh, Citron, a professor at Boston University, who've written about revenge porn, who talk about the publication uh, by exes of intimate images for the purpose of embarrassment, for the purpose of harm. Non-physical, to be sure, but the harm is very real. And I think it does flow from the tort articulated by Brandeis in the 19th century and very relevant to our digital age to think increasingly about the ways our personal information, our digital identity is misused by others to cause us harm and how the law needs to respond and how we need to be able to establish claims that courts recognize to address those harms. Danielle and, and Carrie have done uh, tremendous work on that front. But there's also a shortcoming in all of this analysis. You see, the privacy tort, even as conceived by Brandeis, was of an analog era. It was a one-to-one -one type of infraction. And we live today in a digital age where tremendous amounts of information about us are accumulated, are analyzed, are distilled to extract value from us. Shoshana Zuboff has described this as surveillance capitalism. And as we think about the legal response to that challenge, I think we need to move beyond the traditional framing in tort which is a good cornerstone, but it is not the edifice that we need. So I'm going to take a few moments now to outline what I believe a comprehensive privacy law in the United States would look like. And in doing so, I'm also going to acknowledge that we are today with the establishment of privacy law I imagine we're advocates for consumer protection and environmental protection and safety in the workplace were many years ago. We are today, in fact, confronting many myths generated by corporations who have absolutely no interest in being regulated. They think it's on us to solve this problem. They think if we're not happy with their particular social network service, we can go out and find another social network service. Because like there are a whole slew of network services with 2.5 billion members, right? You just click off of one and you're on to another and that's working for you. There's a reference in Ralph's book, Unsafe at Any Speed, that really has uh, stuck with me uh, during this uh, debate. And it's also a little bit uh, personal. I don't know if I've ever told you this story before. But you describe a congressional hearing about seatbelt legislation. And you describe how the CEOs of the major car manufacturers testified in Congress against seatbelt legislation, saying uh, this wasn't necessary, that all drivers needed to do, do when they thought they were about to have an accident was to simply take their hand off the steering wheel, 
and extend it to the side to protect their loved one, yes? Because that's the smart thing to do as you're about to have an accident, right? It's to take your hand off. And I guess they actually acted this out in the hearing room because you uh, describe it uh, in, in your book. Um, I was in a car, young kid, with my dad in the late 60s. I don't think we had seat belts in the car. Uh, we uh, almost did have an accident. He took his hand off the wheel. I was sitting in the front seat. Thankfully, I didn't hit anything, but it kind of stuck with me at the moment how absurd that recommendation was as an argument against seat belts. Well, let me tell you something. Everybody who's smiling and laughing, all of these companies that are telling you if you want to protect your privacy, here are the 611 things you need to do, which by the way, unfortunately, Consumer Reports did a year ago. And I told them, why don't you tell people about the 611 things they need to do when they're driving to avoid accidents? I mean, it's equally useless. Putting the responsibility back on us because their products, their services are not safely designed. Some of this, I imagine, sounds very familiar to some people in this room, but as far as it goes in Washington, it has still not sunk in. I talk to members of Congress and they say, oh yes, we should make sure that people read privacy policies. And I'm like, what? They've got nothing better to do with their lives? They're going to sit at home and read it? Well, they should check their privacy settings. Yeah, that's also a very useful thing to do. All of this, all of this, wrongly puts on the user of the service the responsibility for ensuring that the service works as it should. How do we write a privacy law? Let me tell you how. We begin by allocating rights and responsibilities, because folks, that's what laws do. They say to companies, if you're going to collect and use personal data, the responsibility is on you to make sure that it's not hacked by the Chinese government. That's not hypothetical, by the way. That actually happens. And the rights go to the individual who has given up the personal information. And by the way, you don't have to be like a rabid privacy advocate hiding in the basement with a bag of rice to see the world this way. The economists will tell you the same thing. That's the efficient thing to do, because the entity in possession of the data is, wait for it, is the least cost avoider. The company's in a better position to protect your data once it has your data than you are, because you're not in there going like, oh, that's not triple des, got to change that. It's the company that bears the responsibility for protecting the information it chooses to collect. And I make that point also because many companies in the United States, having heard that data is oil, decided they want as much of it as they can get, including gathering credit card numbers and social security numbers with no real ability to safeguard any of it, leaving you exposed to the risk when the data breach occurs. So the first thing the privacy law does is it allocates the responsibilities to protect the data to the company that chooses to collect it and gives individuals the right to bring suits. Now here's another important part of my privacy law. Yes, people should have their day in court, they should have the opportunity to sue, and they shouldn't be required to show just to get into court that they know precisely the harm that they might have suffered or may suffer in the future. We've done about a dozen cases all across the country in the last couple of years on a legal doctrine known as standing. And the standing doctrine tries to answer the question, do you have an actual controversy here that a court has to hear? And the industry in this field has taken the position, well, you know, unless you can show us some harm that you've suffered, you don't even get to bring your 
case, right? And our view is, hang on, just a moment. We're talking about stolen data, a security system that's been breached, obtained by criminal hackers, very hard to know who has access and how it's been used or might be used. Let's at least have a case and see what happened, right? Our argument is this, where there's a legal obligation that's been breached, that is the basis for standing. And then we can have a conversation about what the appropriate damages are, what the outcome in the case will be. And good news, we're actually making some progress on the standing front. This is actually one of the areas where I do agree with Justice Thomas, and it is Justice Thomas, I think, citing Blackstone, who says that a violation of a legal right is an injury in fact. That's important. I'm going to take a swing today at the Federal Trade Commission, if that's okay. Got a thumb, I got a thumbs up. 20 years ago, I was trying to get the Federal Trade Commission to act as a privacy agency because we did not have a privacy agency unlike uh, most other democratic countries in the world. I thought we needed a privacy agency. I wrote a bill, we got it to the Senate floor, we got 24 votes. Apparently that's not enough to pass legislation, who knew? So we went to the FTC and I gave them like a rule book. I said, okay, this is how you can be a privacy agency. And they're like, thank you so much. And we spent about 20 years bringing cases involving Microsoft and ChoicePoint and Google and Facebook, two big decisions involving Google and Facebook in 2011. Big consent orders, big announcements. I went over to Europe and I said to everybody, we don't need a privacy agency in the United States. The FTC has these great legal judgments against these internet giants. Privacy is taken care of. The FTC's got it. Let's move on to some other stuff. Go for drinks. Boy, was that a mistake. <laughs> Eight years went, and they didn't bring a single enforcement action against Google or Facebook. We actually sued the FTC. How's that for consumer advocacy? Epic versus Federal Trade Commission. Because they failed to enforce their own consent orders. And it was only after this spring when we stood in front of the FTC with the banners and buttons that said enforce the order that they finally announced a judgment against Facebook. And they wanted everyone to be very impressed. It was a very big judgment. It was a lot of money. It was $5 billion. People were like, whoa, you guys must be really happy. $5 billion judgment against Facebook. And we're like, no, it's a bad outcome. We're going to intervene and we're going to try to get it improved. And they said, well, what is the problem? Doesn't that send a message? I said, you know the message it sent to the stock market after that penalty that left Facebook's business plan in place and gave them the green light to go ahead and, and integrate Instagram and WhatsApp into Facebook Messenger so there would be the dominant platform without any market competition? The message that it sent to the market, listening to the investors, is that Facebook stock went up after the $5 billion judgment against the company. If you're going to have enforcement action in the privacy world, you have to change business practice. You have to put in place standards that safeguard personal data, that limit the collection of personal data, and frankly, that sometimes require the deletion of personal data when it's no longer required or needed. All of those recommendations, EPIC, civil rights groups, consumer groups, children's rights groups had made to the FTC in January of this year, but the FTC ignored us. And the FTC went on to announce what they thought was a grandiose settlement. Now, we weren't alone in this criticism. The first thing you need to know is that the FTC has five commissioners. Two of them dissented forcefully Rebecca Slaughter, Rohit Chopra, both said this settlement provides no benefit to consumers, to users of this service. And they were correct. U.S. Treasury will get $5 billion. They come out ahead. They can have the party. The rest of us, 
not even the t-shirt. On Capitol Hill, also an interesting point about privacy, it's remarkably bipartisan. And we had Ed Markey and Hawley, Louisiana, I think, yes, both opposing the settlement, calling it a slap on the wrist, calling it a parking ticket. So another part of my national privacy proposal is to create a data protection agency in the United States. I think it's time. We tried, we spent 20 years, we gave the FTC every opportunity. They may be good at fixing toasters, but when it comes to data protection, this is not their thing. They're not doing it. All right, a couple of more points on federal legislation. We need to make clear to Congress that while we do want a national law, we want a baseline law. We want a floor. And if other states come up with better protections than what is established in Washington, D.C., they should be free to go forward. And the big concern we have today in Washington, D.C., about privacy legislation is that many of the proposals are being introduced to preempt, which is to say overwrite, a good privacy law that was enacted last year in California. And the industry groups came to Washington, D.C., and they said, well, that California thing, they're, they're getting a little out of control out, out in the sunshine, whatever. Got to slow that down a bit. So they come to Congress and they say, why don't we turn down the dial on some of those rights, some of those security obligations, some of those privacy obligations, make that a national standard, make it a ceiling so we don't have to deal with all these troubling states that might want to do more for their residents and for their consumers. We are opposing those proposals to preempt state law. We actually did a report recently, you can find it online, called Grading on a Curve, Privacy Legislation in Congress. And we made a couple of points in this report. If you picked it up from the title, first of all, none of the proposals are very good. On a one to a hundred, our top score was a 48, which was good, right, I guess. I've learned also teaching at law school that you gotta give somebody an A. So that went to uh, Ed Markey, and it's a good bill by comparison. But as I said, it's like a 48. Uh, one bill, remember, this was on a one to a hundred, got a minus four. Now that took some work, that was Senator Blackburn. What were we objecting to? We were objecting to the fact that she wanted to put in place essentially a notice and choice disclaimer requirement as a federal privacy law for anything that the states might choose to do, which is quite simply an anti anti, hold it, that's the wrong number. Take out one ante or add another. It would be bad for privacy, right? That's not the proposal we want. So that's what a good federal privacy law looks like. Allocate rights and responsibilities, give people the ability to enforce their rights, create an enforcement agency that's committed to data protection, don't preempt better state law. Now I'm gonna make a final comment about this whole thing with Europe. I think we can learn a lot from the EU about the development of privacy protection. I think they've done a very good job over the years engaging this very real challenge. And I think they are, let me say, less captured in the political sense by the industries that need to be regulated. And so what you see watching the European institutions regulating in the privacy field is a good, healthy debate about different approaches to a real challenge and legislative solutions that are, in fact, somewhat imperfect and that will need to be improved over time. But folks, that's what democracy looks like, and that's what we need to see more of. In the US on this issue, it is the firms that are directing the debate. 
telling the members of Congress what to say, telling their staff there are great opportunities for them in Silicon Valley when they get done with their time in DC. We all need to work really hard to engage in the democratic debate about the future of privacy protection because we all have an interest in this. And as a tort concept for the 21st century, for the digital age, I don't think there are many that are more important. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so in terms of just talking about uh, uh, some of the things that Mark was talking about, for, especially for those who haven't gone to law school, sometimes people just assume that when you talk about procedure, uh, that procedure isn't as important as substance. So preemption and standing isn't as important as actually talking about civil rights or, or worker rights. But it actually is just as important because these are the ways that you get into court. These are the ways that you're able to vindicate your rights. And if, you, if we don't have uh, strong, um, if, we, if we don't have strong protections and strong laws uh, that protect the ability to get into court, you will never be able to get into court. And in fact, um, this coming term, the Supreme Court is going to hear case on pleading, which is the thing that you need to, to do well in order to get and stay into court. Um, and a few years ago, the, 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 the Supreme Court made it even harder, uh, the, the pleading standard even harder. Um, and, and that has had uh, serious effects on the ability for people to get and stay in the court. And, and um, the court is going to hear another case. It's Retirement Plans Committee of IBM versus Gender this term. So hopefully they will um, not make it even harder than it already is, but stay tuned for that. <laughs>